my friends, and welcome to another episode of Ghost Stories in Folklore. How many places did we stop at today? Uh, we stopped at six today. Six different places? We did. Why don't we tell them about it? Peeps, and welcome to this episode of Ghost Stories and Folklore. What? That's Where's right. Forrest? Forrest is home on vacation taking care of the home stuff. But we did stop at six different haunted locations in the Toledo area today. And we're going to share them with you. We're going to share the ghost stories and folklore about those locations. And we got some footage. So you guys watch this. And we're going to come back for the last one. Watch this. We'll be right back. The Toledo Yacht Club is among the oldest yacht clubs in North America. The club was founded in 1865 under the name Toledo Boat Club when two rowing clubs joined together and turned their attention to sailing. The club was incorporated on October 3rd of 1885. In 1904, the club readopted the name Toledo Yacht Club. The first clubhouse was erected in 1878 on Guard Island near the mouth of the Ottawa River. In 1890, a more elaborate structure with sleeping rooms and a second floor was built. And then in 1896, a rival club, the Ohio Yacht Club, unsuccessfully attempted to take over the Toledo Yacht Club's Guard Island lease. Later that year, the two clubs merged under the name Toledo Yachting Association, maintaining city quarters in the Neptune Building in Toledo, Ohio. When Bayview Park was developed, a 25-year lease was granted to the Toledo Yachting Association and a wood frame clubhouse was erected at the present site of the club in 1903. In 1906, a fire completely destroyed the club and all of its historic contents, but by 1908, a new steel-reinforced concrete Spanish-style clubhouse was built on the site. This historic building still remains basically the same today and was listed on the National Register of Historic Places on December 12th of 1976. The Toledo Yacht Club was featured on Haunted Cases in Paranormal Series Ghost Hunters on the August 24th, 2016 Season 11 episode, Children in the Attic. Taps investigated with their client and clubs and events manager Susan Hurst and her 11-year-old son, Hunter, who made contact with Jacob, a 10-year-old boy spirit who claims that he fell off the ballroom balcony because he was leaning on the railing. He fell off, landed on the hardwood floor, and cracked his head open and died in 1910. It is said that Jacob is seen on the balcony, along with his parents, haunting the place. Now, Chad Dye, who is the lead investigator for Erie Shore's paranormal team, has provided us with more paranormal claims for the location. They've conducted several private and public investigations in the building and also host the annual Midwest Parafest at the location. Some of the claims that Chad reported to us are that people have said there's a woman in a yellow dress in the ballroom, a woman crying at a vanity in the women's restroom, a past Commodore complaining about his Manhattan drink at the bar, and bartenders have had someone whisper their name right into their ear when nobody was there. Multiple shadow people and shadow play occurs in the basement den bar, and Jacob has been seen in multiple rooms, not just the attic.
next we want to talk about the Jefferson Junior High School. Originally construction began on a building in 1927 which featured 14 classrooms for a capacity of 275 students and a gymnasium with permanent seating for 200 and 20 foot ceilings. Over the years the building has had several additions and now has 28 classrooms with a capacity of 1,040 students and a total area of 60,500 square feet. Jefferson Junior High School in Toledo has had claims of sounds of the bell tolling that can be heard in the middle of the night, but the bell was removed from the belfry years ago. The ghost of a janitor known as Oscar is said to watch every school play from the auditorium balcony. There is a seat that they reserve for him because he becomes angry whenever someone else sits in his seat and will cause something to go wrong with the play that's being performed. Take a moment and listen to this testimony of a parent who sends their children to this school and talks about Oscar. All right, we have Dana here that lives in Toledo is going to tell us a little bit about that haunted school. Theater, and we've noticed a lot of different things happening when we have um, things going on in the theater. Um, we do have um, one that's known is that we have a janitor that we keep one empty seat because he used to always sit up there and just kind of hackle the students. And um, recently we've had some activity where we had students that had passed away um, previously in this earlier in this year. And when we did our last production in the fall, we actually had a lot of like kitty pranks going on in the theater and just a lot of weird things that you normally wouldn't have theater kids do. So it's been pretty interesting. The next location we have for you today is West Toledo Branch Library. The West Toledo Branch opened in its present building in 1930. In 2001, the branch remodeled and expanded. In 2013, for remodeling and upgrades again, the branch was closed for an entire year, where it expanded from 18,987 to 21,515 square feet. It reopened to the public in October of 2014 with exciting new features like the first ever 3D printer and creation studio, complete with GarageBand for Mac. This library is a beloved community center that the entire neighborhood is actually called Library Village. This library is rumored to be haunted by a man from about 1940. His spirit has been seen and eerie noises and bumping sounds have been heard coming from the area near the West Wall fireplace. Next, we'll travel over to the historic Woodlawn Cemetery. Woodlawn Cemetery has long been a favorite among ghost hunters and thrill seekers due to its history of being the final resting place for many of Toledo's early founders. The giant pyramid in the middle of the place might have something to do with it as well. Founded in 1876, not 1878, as other sites have claimed, Woodlawn achieved national historical status in 1998. It's home to 42 mausoleums, most of which are from the prominent families who helped Toledo grow and prosper into the city it is today. If you are from the Toledo area, I'm sure you'll recognize these names. Burden, Secker, Spitzer, Snyder, Stranahan, just to name a few. There are two notable Civil War officers that are buried here as well, 
Major General James B. Steedman, who fought at Chickamauga, and Colonel Henry G. Newbert, who participated in Sherman's March to the Sea, have monuments erected in their honor. The most famous monument in the cemetery is the Pyramid, and it's the one thing everyone remembers about their visit to Woodlawn. The Pyramid stands 26 feet tall and weighs an estimated 1,000 tons. It marks the grave of John Gungle, the founder of Toledo Newsboys Association. Many have claimed to capture interesting ghostly photos around this monument. Legend has it that there are rumors of cult activity going on inside the cemetery as well. As far as we know, no one has actually seen this cult activity as it happens. But there are reports of paraphernalia and occult-oriented graffiti being found by cemetery ground staff. Many have reported seeing a ghostly woman in a white dress moving through the cemetery. She is most often seen at night, though some have claimed a daylight encounter. Eyewitnesses say she wanders frequently near the gates leading into the cemetery. There have been few who have reported this phantom woman has even spoken to them, asking if they have seen her lost daughter. No one knows exactly who she is, or if she's even a permanent resident at the cemetery. Many claim to have seen her, or at least glimpses of her, but to our knowledge no one has been able to catch her appearance on film. Center. This is Toledo's largest and oldest structure. The Collingwood Arts Center is an immense and ominous six-floored, high-pitched tile roof brick building with an attic and a huge basement. It's all completely made with an elaborate carved window frame set and a mansard roof tower. This architecture is described as being Flemish Gothic in design and blends together the Gothic and Romanesque styles. It was designed by architect E.O. Fallis. This large 113,000 square foot rectangular building sits sideways on the lot and it opened in 1905 as a new teaching covenant for nuns in the Ursuline Order of the Sacred Heart, St. Ursula Academy. In 1922, Mary Manx College was established here and finally it became a retirement home for nuns. When the retirement home closed, the building stood vacant for several years until 1985 when a man with a dream, Pat Tansley, rented the woe-begone building and the Gerber house in hopes of creating a community center. The Collingwood Arts Center was started rescuing these classic buildings from decay and saving them from the wrecking ball of their future. At some time, the property was bought outright from the Ursuline Order. A third Victorian house next to the Gerber house was also bought and is currently being restored. Some nuns became very attached to their convent work here as they refused to let go of this world and not go to the other side. In the 1950s, a distraught nun hung herself in the basement. When the building was vacant, an occult group broke in and had ceremonies in the basement. In the attic of the main building, there's a spirit of a loving nun with a bright smile and a friendly countenance who smiles and waves at the living, likes to spend her time sewing clothes and perhaps just finishing some projects she's working on. In contrast though, the basement has a very dark entity that has been haunting the basement and the stairways to the basement and also the Gerber house since the 1950s. Some believe this could be the spirit of the nun that committed suicide there. There are many other spirits reported within the structure of the buildings, but for the purpose of this, we're just gonna move on to the next location. So the last location has been in Panic D for some time. The other ones, they're new locations for us. We have to do a little bit more research and stuff and get them in Panic D. 
But the last one has been in Bay, uh, Panic D, the, what is it, Molly Brewing Company, Molly Bay Brewing Company. Right. It's been in there. I wanted to stop there because it, it keeps popping up every time we put it out and all that stuff like that. We got to eat lunch there. We did. Pretty cool place. Food was excellent. We had water at the brewing company. We had water at the brewing company. <laughs> So watch this real quick for the ghost stories and folklore of the Mommy Bay Brewing Company or the Oliver House. The Mommy Bay Brewing Company, also known as the Oliver House. When Oliver House opened its doors in 1859, Toledo, with a population nearing 10,000, was in the midst of progress. As a railroad center and growing commercial metropolis, the city served as the county seat, boasted a telegraph line, and had erected a bridge to span the Maumee River. When commissioned by Major William Oliver, renowned architect Isaiah Rogers designed the first-class modern hotel for one of the most delightful portions of the city. Located in the section of downtown referred to as the Middle Ground, the hotel would have a main front overlooking a beautiful park with shade trees and private rooms that offered a view of the Maumee River. Famous for his palace hotel designs, Rogers also gained national recognition as Chief of the Bureau of Construction in the U.S. Treasury Department, a position appointed to him by President Lincoln. Over the years, the Oliver House has had many different owners and has served many different functions. The building even served as a medical center for the wounded during the Spanish-American War, and this historic hotel has a very haunted reputation. An addition, which was added in 1965, was built on top of bones of an Indian warrior chief whose grave was inadvertently dug up by a construction crew they simply reburied the bones and went about their business. When the current owners bought the building, they tore down the addition to make way for a new renovation project and the bones were again discovered. They called the local Indian authorities who did a sage and tobacco ceremony to calm the spirit. Numerous apparitions have appeared to guests and diners over the years. The most common is that of a soldier who's come to be known as the captain. He is said to show up most frequently dressed in full uniform. Paranormal investigations and strange sightings are very, very common here. Now one added bonus location that we drove by basically is the Pythian Castle. Now we haven't been able to find any type of paranormal claims for this building yet, but we thought we would include it because this building just looks creepy. Especially since some of the top floors are starting to uh, cave in. There you go, pretty exciting day. Even though it's we're heading home, weekend's over, but we had fun. We hit the, actually what, three or four more places too, but they weren't in the Toledo area. So, yes. hope you guys enjoyed it, and uh, next Ghost Stories and Folklore, Boris will be back. So. He doesn't get vacation forever. No, not forever, just for this one. But hey, till next time. Thanks for watching. And happy hunting. Like this episode of Ghost Stories and Folklore, be sure to hit the like button. And if you would like more videos from Panity videos in the future, make sure you hit the subscribe and the bell for notifications. If you dare. <laughs>